Hello, and welcome to the Tips with Tony podcast. I'm Tony Marinucci, your registered dietitian, helping you get healthy one bite at a time. I am really excited about this interview. Like, I've always been excited about my guests because they're awesome, but this one in particular is extremely awesome. I have known her for a while now. Um, we back in when I was in college, which is over 10 years ago, which is crazy, like insane crazy. <laughs> the fact that I was in college over 10 years ago is weird. Um, <laughs> but um, so Rebecca, who our guest, Rebecca Harriton, she's a health educator. And I was her intern in college. And I was part of this group. It was called uh, Pures. At, um, oh my God. Oh my God. Choices. It was called yeah. Choices. I was thinking in my high school days. I was like, Pures as leaders. No, um, it was called Choices. And we did a lot of great stuff for the college campus and spread awareness about everything from physical health to mental health to sexual health. It was just really, really a great club for me to be a part of. And Rebecca has a ton of knowledge. I love her perspective. Um, we're going to talk about so many great, great things. Um, so anyways, Rebecca, without further ado, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you. This has been something I've been looking forward to since we set the date a couple of weeks ago. It's nice. Yeah. Nice little thing in the winter to have. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And it got us to connect. Like we, you know, we talk through social media here and there, but it's nice to, you know, have a real conversation and really talk through because you always make the best comments like on my pages, like, and when I'm talking about things like emotional eating and one comment you made was so good. We were like, why are we blaming the extra cookie? Like, why aren't we checking in with like, wh where did I overbook myself or like what's going on? And it's just, it was like, like so on point and I love that you get me. I love that you get what I'm talking and put it out there. Um, so it's, it's very refreshing. Um, so anyways, let's get, um, have you introduce yourself, maybe just share a little bit about who you are, what you do, and more importantly, why you do what you do. So my current role is as health educator at SUNY Oneonta. This is, I don't know, 17 or 18 years in at this point. I feel like this year doesn't count in some ways, and yet it <laughs> counts for like extra. I don't know how mm -hmm. that, how that mm -hmm. mentally works out in the end. Uh, my role on campus is kind of like the public health branch of the college health services. And there's certainly counterparts to what I do on college campuses across um, across the United States. It's a pretty standard model of wellness. And so I actually do a lot of sexual violence prevention work. Um, I think when you start to do that work, you also have to start to take on the alcohol, other drug stuff. And, you know, and I think mental health is really driving a lot of everything too. You know, so you start to uncover stones and then you start to see the systemness mm -hmm. of things. And I think, you know, and I think nutrition and sleep, and there's like these handful of other like little small pieces of health and wellness that are kind of out there. But, you know, I, I do feel like, I don't know, maybe I'm like the solar system, like in development of like, I'm starting to see how like all the planets orbit each other. And some of the planets have moons, but, you know, they, everything interconnects and it's really interesting in Western culture that we try to take it apart and try to look mm. at things and in the small ways, like the, you know, the cookie, like you know, some days you're stressed and a cookie is the best way to fix it because mm -hmm. you don't have time for therapy or whatever the, you know, it's, it's just, a, some days it's just a cookie. <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. And, you know, I think as of late, I've gotten more into doing online training and learning, you know, that aspect of, of health communication. But I, I love that part of like, how do you create small snippets that really, like hit the point that can't be misread that that people can connect to and I really I really like solving those kinds of problems yeah what do, what made you get into this because you're so good at what you do and you're so passionate about it so I'm curious like your story yeah well so I actually went to school to be a music teacher and then I taught middle school music for five years and I really loved you know like some people are like oh my gosh middle school but I really loved my middle school students and I I think what I love about middle school age is that it's the first time they're looking outside their immediate family. So if they're growing up in a safe home, their you know their natural tendency to look outside is starting at that point, and they're looking at other adults and thinking like, oh, like maybe I could be like that person. And I I think that's a cool place of exploration. And then it seems like it kind of closes up again during high school. And high school students, if you're near any of them, they know everything, and they don't want you to give them any advice or give them any input. Like no, like it's bad. 
But then I think you get to college and it's like that second time of like, oh my gosh, like I do have to go figure out who I want to be in the world. And I think about it all the time. Like if somebody had told me at 18 that I was still going through brain development, I would have been pretty angry and like not listen to it. And now in my mid forties, I'm like, wow, like this is amazing. Like you just never stop growing. You never stop thinking about things in other ways. And I think, you know, what has allowed me to be successful in my space is the fact that I'm just very interested in lots of things, but then I see how they can all be brought together and come together into a single space. And, you know, like I think like right now, like mental health has to be a part of every conversation. Yes. Like it's, you know, as, and as we start to have more brain body science to drive that forward, you know, we can revisit things. We can look at Black Lives Matter movement and we can revisit things because we've gotten so many messages that were inaccurate. It wasn't just, you know, what you learned about George Washington when you did President's Weekend Crafts in elementary school, like everything, everything has changed and different and we have to be willing to seek that out. And it's not bad. It's just, you know, getting the chance to uncover new things. Definitely, definitely. And you provide a safe space to do that. And you take on all type of interns, right? Like, so I was obviously, a, I was in di- a major, like dietetics major, mm-hmm. but what are their types? Because also too, I know students listen to this and I know some only students listen to this. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I've had a long standing relationship with the psychology department and that was really where my internship program began. But Right now I have somebody from communication. I have sociology interns coming in. I even have a a business student this semester, but she's interested in going into public health as a master's degree with a focus on policy writing. So it's, I think that there's a lot of students that like one, you know, it's like undergrad is just like one step. And as they're starting to realize where they want to make an impact in the world, public health does speak to a lot of folks. And so then when they start looking for internships, they cross paths with me, but I'm also working a little bit more closely with student association at this point too. There's a lot of student energy towards doing more around mental health and, you know, just the ongoing conversations around sexual violence. So, you know, I'm in a really great place. I get to have lots of cool conversations. And you get to help a lot of people in the process, you, whether it's with the people you work with directly or what they then go do in their community and, you know, helping their peers. It's, it's really, really awesome. Yeah. So let's talk about a lot of the stuff that you're super knowledgeable about. So one thing that we've talked about in the past, like offline is about the stages of change theory. Can you talk about that and why it's so important? Sure. And stages of change theory um, or trans theoretical model of change and Prochaska and DeClement, they were the two folks at the start of that. And it actually came out of smoking cessation research. And it's a human behavioral change model. And there's five stages of change. Although you can think of it more of like a spiral model, Uh, you know, and I think culturally we have like that term of falling off the wagon to kind of explain, like you kind of get through the whole stages of change and then sometimes it starts over again. So I I use my own example of like my love hate relationship with running as how I talk people through this. So um, there's pre-contemplation, which is, I don't even, don't even want to think about it. Like I know people run, it's not anything I'm ever going to do. <laughs> it's just out there. I don't really care to, you know, converse any further about it. Um, contemplation is like, you know, running's an exercise. A lot of people get into, I, I can maybe do that. It's like not something I feel totally called for, but you know, I might start paying a little bit more attention. I might go look at the apps that are available or, you know, how much do running shoes cost? And then preparation is really getting into that space. What am I going to do to make that change? And, you know, now I am really actively learning and finding out more about what would, what it would take, maybe talking with other people that are runners and how they got started. And then active um, in the action stage is really when you're visibly doing that change. So I'm putting on my sneakers, I'm setting a date at 9 a.m. in the morning, and I'm going out the front door to run. And I think the thing I like to make point out about action stages to other people, that's when you're first visibly making the change. But prior to that, you're doing a lot of work getting to those places. And then maintenance is that, yeah, you know, like you got to keep it up. Like, you know, there's that newness level of like when you first start an exercise program, or I think fad diets are like a really great example there too. It's like you really gung ho and you have a lot of energy to give it, but then it becomes the daily routine and it's not new and shiny anymore. And are you going to stick with it or not stick with it? 
Um, and so maintenance is that, and sometimes you'll see people refer to it as like maintenance slash relapse, where we just know that there are some behaviors that are really hard to sustain. Like I'm just not an exercise lover. So I, you know, and like right now it's cold. I don't go outside when it's cold outside, like running, unless, unless I'm commit to buying a treadmill, like running's not a thing I do in the winter. So yes. Yeah, so, I you know, literally, so I was just like, you know, I do our, I use, I did orange theory before the pandemic and I, it's a good, I like that workout program, like going there. And I was just talking to someone who, um, you know, goes there and I was like, I'm thinking about going back. Like, basically long story short she's like yeah I know it's so hard to like do cardio on your own I'm like I don't do cardio on my own <laughs> like I, I just don't she's like she's like she's like it's harder to do cardio on your own I'm like I just don't do it on my own like I need to be in an environment that's going to push me to get there and because I do it in more in the summer because it's beautiful out like but in the winter like I don't have a treadmill where I live right now like it's like not possible like I could do like jumping and stuff but the people downstairs would literally hate me um so but it's just so funny that like yeah, I'm yeah. right there with you, you know, and, so. And so I do think like when we, when we take on good habits, like we feel really good about that. And then when we stop doing them, we internalize some guilt. But I think when you can reframe it to like, this is just the process and it's not the end, it's right. just the start of the new cycle over again. Like mm -hmm. I think removing some of those negative emotions from the experience can really be helpful you know, anything when we talk about that with like diet, like, you know, for me, it's like, you know, it's making that list and like, okay, like, what am I going to do if, and when, like, you know, I know I get hungry in the afternoon, what's my snack going to be and thinking about it ahead of time of, mm -hmm. you know, that it, it is those small little habit changes. And like I said, I, I and I think the important thing about stages of change is when you're working with other folks, but I think sometimes like, like there's the two voices in your head too, and you're like working through stuff and being able to identify where that other voice is coming from can be really important because if we're in a helper role and they're talking and they're very much in a pre-contemplation place of like, they don't even have the starting point of the knowledge, like telling them to like set a date to start to do the thing just feels really far away and really difficult. Or, and I think that works in reverse too. If I'm talking with somebody about their alcohol use and I'm identifying it as problematic, but I'm also identifying as like, this person, like this alcohol might be their only coping skill. And so asking them to give it up is really scary to them. Right. So I'm thinking about their physical health, but I also have to remember their emotional health. And so, okay, how are we going to, what's a small step or what's a little bit of a thing that I can get you going on so that mm -hmm. when we, you know, we can somehow balance out that, like, let's get your alcohol consumption into a healthier space, but you know, not, not do it in a scary way. Cause if it's scary, you're not going to do it. I mean, I feel like we've all come home from like those doctor's appointments where you're like given like the, like, you need to do all of these things. And you're like, Nope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's overwhelming for sure. Um, but also too, like, I think the, the thing, the great thing that you just said is that we have to recognize it as a process and people think they're only making progress in the action phase. That's really key because as we knew, we're talking about the stages, I'm thinking like when that pre-contemplation stage, when you're saying like, you know, I, I feel like, you know, running's available to me. I'm not really going to do it, like whatever, or even like the contemplation stage of like, we're thinking about it. There's also like that brain, that part in the brain all the way in the back that's telling you like, why can't you just freaking start? Like, why aren't you running already? Like, why is this so difficult to you? And like, we just beat ourselves up and then that doesn't motivate us anymore. It doesn't make us want to do anything for ourselves. And you're like, we have to be patient with ourselves and to recognize that there's different seasons for everything. And there's different times where things take precedence and like, it's okay. But like, I think the biggest thing is to just ask, like, you know, is this important to me? Why is this important to me? Like, what would this look like? And just explore, get exploratory, get curious. You don't have to be so definitive and like, I need to do this. It, it just feels so like yeah. trapping, like if well, you feel it, put it that way. And I think that a lot of health messaging traditionally, or, you know, I'll say traditionally, like in my lived experience since the late seventies has been very fear tactic based yeah. and truthfully happiness is a stronger motivator for humans. I mean, we have receptors in our brains for serotonin and dopamine and all these things that make us feel good. So instead of like trying to run away from something that's fearful, you know, putting it into that space of yeah. this is gonna make me feel good. Definitely. Definitely. 
Yeah, this is, this is so great. This is so great. And then the last part that I, you mentioned was about like that maintenance phase where, and like, I like that you said a, a spiral. I like that. It's normal to slip up, right? It's normal to kind of go back. Like we're creatures of habit. And, and when we're trying to create a new one, it's very challenging for us because we like what feels safe. So it's nor so just almost like expect that when you're in maintenance, you might potentially go back, but that doesn't mean that you can't go back into maintenance. Like it's just, it's like a pendulum. Like you just like figure it out. <laughs> yeah. And I think what's interesting. So before I started working at SUNY Oneana, I worked in a domestic violence program. One of the common facts in that space is that, and you know, there's a very heteronormative model, but this was the data that was available, you know, 20 years ago. And I was doing this work was that it would take a woman seven to nine times before she left an abusive partner for good. Mm. And then when I started at Oneana and started doing smoking cessation, it's five to seven times, five to seven quit attempts before you quit for good. It is a spiral process. And some folks are really hesitant to share that information with folks, but I think it's so important. And I, you know, being in places where I've supported family members or friends who are dealing with somebody else who's in an unhealthy relationship and trying to pull them out of letting them know that odds are good they're gonna go back if it's the first or second time and that's just part of the process that you're we're gaining knowledge in each mm -hmm. of those things and so mm -hmm. i think the spiral model which kind of makes it feel like we're moving forward we're just kind of to you know front and and i think that's even more like easier to bear than like two steps forward one step back like we're, we're moving forward it's just right. you know it's not a straight line forward and that's, right. that's just what it is so I think it is interesting that that human behavior shows up and kind of I mean five to seven and seven to nine are pretty similar when we start thinking about like the statistics of human experience and mm -hmm. you know it's okay what what did you learn you know what did I learn the first time I quit running was I don't like running when it's cold out and <laughs> make me like overcome that. Like, it's yeah. just, you know, you got to find a different exercise in the winter and, yeah. you know, and, and like for, like, even for me getting back in the spring, it's like, once it's 50 degrees, then I'll start thinking about it and I don't have totally. to feel until the days are above 50. Exactly. Degrees. Right. You just accept it. It's just an acceptance. Like this is the season for this and for that. And that's okay. So that's awesome. So what about, let's talk a little bit about the polyvagal theory and how it plays a role in our daily life. Sure, so polyvagal theory is something I stumbled on a little over a year ago. And it's funny because I think now as we're coming up on the one year anniversary of everything kind of being shut down and closed up. I had the original book and the, the theory was started by Dr. Stephen with a PH Porges, P-O-R-G-E-S. He's a medical doctor and I bought his book and I like suffered. I was like, I'm gonna read this every word I like I, it's been a long time like you were talking about being in college 10 years ago for me it was over 20 and I was like I don't <laughs> recall reading a book where I needed to like look up this many Actually, like, pay attention. So long. yeah <laughs> <laughs> and I had a conference in New Orleans and the book went to New Orleans with me and I read it in the Tampa airport during a layover and then I brought it with me on vacation like this book has so many miles um and now kind of this memory of like the last book I read when life was normal oh. um there's an easier book to get it through it's called the polyvagal theory and therapy and the author is deb dana d-a-n-a -A, and i wish i had read that one first um, <laughs> and there's also a really excellent podcast called stuck not broken and that was really where i started getting into it because i would download a couple episodes and i was you know i was like binging it on my commute back and forth to i work. like that phrase and, stuck yeah not broken and, and that one is done by a licensed marriage and family therapist by the name of Justin Sinceri. And he's a high school based counselor. So it's, it's pretty cool. Cause you know, and if you work with young kids at all, like you, or if you, start, have. Or if you have kids, you have it's, kid. like, yeah. it's excellent. So like, that's like kind of all the background knowledge and what you, where you can go searching for next and talking with some of our neuropsych folks on campus, some of the stuff that Porges has hypothesized hasn't totally vetted out in the research from the neuropsych community, but where it really stands true right now is in the therapy space. So I think of it as like, it's the owner's manual to having a human body with a nervous system. And it, it expands on our knowledge of the sympathetic and parasympathetic system. So those are probably words that a lot of people are like, oh, I know those, but <laughs> where, do, where does that come in? So a lot of people are familiar with the flight or fight kind of system. And so backing that up. So Polyvagal is referring to the vagus nerve, which is one of the nerves that leaves the brainstem and goes everywhere. And, and 
vagal, I guess, means wanderer in Latin or something like that. So it connects like all of like your spleen and your liver and your heart and your guts. And so like when you think about like when something super stresses you out, you feel it in your gut, you feel it mm-hmm. in your heart, you feel it mm-hmm. all over your body. And it's that mm-hmm. nerve that is driving all of that. And 80% of the signal is coming from the body into the brain on that nerve. And only 20% of that nerve is taking signal down out. And so there's three phases that that nerve exists. And there's the safe and social, like we're, we are mammals, we are designed to work in groups, we make eye contact. And it's actually the eye, we're actually when we're making eye contact, reading all the little muscle bits. Um, and especially in the upper part of the face. And when we're in that safe and sound mode, there's what's called vocal prosody. So like, if people are listening, and you're going to hear like, our, our voices are up and down, like the um, pitch spectrum, when we're in safe and social mode, all the nerves connecting, they actually attenuate our middle ear to better hear human voice. Um, so I think, you know, we're just totally tuned to be people with each other. So that's, mm. that's where we need to be when we're healthy. And that's actually one version of the parasympathetic state that, and you know, things are just cool. We are in healing mode. We are in growth mode. We are curious when we're in safe and social mode. Then we start to feel stress and poor just coined this term called neuroception of kind of like this, like all of the signals that your body's constantly taking in and your brain's putting all together. It's not, you know, like, so here's where gut feeling comes into it. It's like, whatever signal happens, you smell a smell, you hear a sound, um, you know, baby cry, burning smell, you know, just gut instinct around somebody like your gut just is telling you like that gets, we get sympathetically aroused. And so the idea in polyvagal is that flight is a preferred form of sympathetic energy. So running away from danger is probably going to take less energy from the body. Um, fight, which is also another way to keep the body safe, but it's going to take more energy, produces the possibility that we might get injured and need to then also invest energy into healing our body. And then the last part, which, and I had kind of come into contact with this through my sexual violence work is a freeze mode. So when, when the Mm. um, parasympathetic system takes back over, so when the body gets so stressed, it things kind of numb out. Um, You know, if you've had a, a work week that's super stressful and you find yourself on the couch on Saturday and you just like you're on the couch like, like you're Netflixing all day and you can't move like that. I feel like that's everyone right now yeah, yeah. We're, yeah. Like, on work overdrive like no outlets to like live yeah 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 and the, and I think you know a lot of us are experiencing that right now mm-hmm. and, and to be able to reframe that of like your body's just doing what it was designed to do it's designed yeah. to heal in that moment and those are times when we're not necessarily as hungry but um, I think flight or fight, we, you know, also describes the snacking that we went through in the early parts of the pandemic. Uh, and and also the fact that, so when we have those charges, either that flight sympathetic energy, we do get fidgety, which is why for kids who are feeling anxious, having like, I mean, I have my little, my little stress balls on my desk all the time. And it, it's that energy that needs to run off. I definitely saw a lot of people talking, people who I knew were runners in March and April are like talking about how they were running so much more. Yeah. Um, just having that energy, people who feel it as fight. And some people, you know, where you go is kind of individual. Um, you know, some people like they call it the home away from home. Like some people have experienced just a lot of trauma and stress in their life. And the smallest amount of additional stress puts them into that freeze space of needing to be on the couch. And that's, that's just who you are. And that's how your system has now been wired. Um, and not to say that you can't undo that, but those are places where, yeah, a therapist is really going to support you finding, finding ways to kind of let some of that neuroception, like let go, like your body mm-hmm. was trained to stay on high alert to keep you safe in uncomfortable spaces. And, mm-hmm. and that's okay. Like, again, it did what it was supposed to do, but you also can find other ways to, you know, work through that. Um, you know, and it, you know, and I think that's hard. Like if you're hearing this for the first time, you might be having an aha moment about your own lived experience and how it's impactful and, you know, so, you know, take care of yourself. And if that's enough, you know, that's cool. You can come back and finish this. Yeah, later. no, I know, we, I know we're talking about some deep stuff. So it, it's, yeah, it might be a little bit hard to hear. Um, so yeah, take a break, come back. But I think that what you brought up is really helpful for people to understand themselves a little bit more. And also, um, 
I'm curious if you like, I think, so I talk about therapy all the time and how I'm a huge advocate for it. Um, but I think that like kind of what you were saying before, sometimes you can't go to therapy in the middle of your work day or like, you know, there's, you know, although your therapist is going to teach you those practices, um, and it's going to help you see things and understand things over time. Are, is there anything that you practice or you could recommend like more like in the immediate when there's someone's feeling in that, like they're, they're feeling uh, threatened or they're in that fight or flight kind of like they're going back into their, um, like everything's kind of like tensing, you know, like yeah. I mean, what kind I of things can they do? I mean, I think it's good to know, like when you start to notice, and I think having that science framework to hang things on, like you can start to be like, oh, like, you know, without getting into details, like I had a scary experience with fire as a young person. And now when I'm sympathetically aroused, I smell burnt toast. And, mm -hmm. you know, like, and it used to be where I'd walk around the house and then, you know, it's like, now I'm like, I look at the smoke detector and I see it's blinking. Like I can, I can tell myself logically that the house isn't on fire, but I still smell that. And now I'm kind of at the point of like, oh, like that's like a body tell to me that I'm sympathetically charged right now. And that maybe the better thing to do is like walk away from work for a minute. You know, does bouncing on the trampoline relieve that? Do I need mm -hmm. to, I do use some biofeedback equipment. Um, it just, you know, take a breath, take a, you know, snack. I have an 11 year old son. So, you know, maybe it's just time to go sit on the floor and do Legos with him for a little bit, but what can I do? My body is reading that there are too many danger signals. And so what are the ones that I can control to give also some safe signals into myself? I love um, that. Um, I think yeah. what, sorry, not to cut you yeah. off, but, um, one thing that I talk about is like, sometimes like even when you like recover from, cause I work with a lot of people who struggle with binge eating disorder. So even when you recover from binge eating disorder you might still have urges to binge. And the question now isn't what, it, what can I eat or what can I do to make this go, feeling go away? The question now becomes because you recognize you have other things to cope. It's, it's coming in, it's like, what's bothering me? What am, what am I, what am I over, what am I doing too much of, or what am I not doing enough of? Like, so maybe I'm not resting enough, but maybe I'm overbooking my schedule too much. Like that's a sign. That's a signal that your body is trying to tell you, like, slow down a little bit, check in what's, what's up. Right. It doesn't mean that you're broken. It doesn't mean that, you know, you have, you know, you even have to respond to it. Really. You just gotta just like take a minute. Yeah. And sometimes that's all it is, is that your body's just like, we just need to take a moment to let you know that the to-do list is too long. And you know, what, what can we do to change that? And I, right. I think also just recognizing that our body does still gear up to respond to things in physical ways. So yeah, you know, I've got, I'm a, live in a two floor house. So sometimes, you know, if I'm feeling flighty running up and down the stairs a couple of times is a way to discharge that energy that my body has built up. Or, you know, if you're getting to that point where you're more of a, a fighty, angry, doing some push ups, some wall push ups so that mm -hmm. those muscles that are gearing up to respond can let go of that energy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think the last thing that's important to point out too, is that if you get down to that free state, you have to go back through the sympathetic charge before you get back to safe and social feeling again. And sometimes if you're not prepared for what that feels like. So um, if you've ever woken up in the middle of the night and felt like tingly all over your body, like that was when I first noticed it after it was brought to my attention, but sometimes it'll feel like there's this electrical charge all over your body. And if you're really been pushed and stressed and into that freezy space, like it's be like, oh my gosh, what's going on now to my body. And, and to be able to reframe that and say, oh, my body's healing. That's pretty awesome. Like I'm mm. doing this thing. Um, or you can kind of push it along too. So um, you know, having a pretty rough start to the school year for us that first weekend I got home and I just, I couldn't get off the couch. I'm like, why, why am I on the couch? Like, there's so many things to do. I don't even care about the things to do. And then it was like, oh, I'm going to freeze. Let me just get up and walk. And I just like, just did a couple of laps. I'm like, oh, there was a, I think I went out and like pruned like my rose bush. I'm like, what's the gentlest thing I can think of to just get my body in motion. And that starts to wake things up again. Definitely. Definitely. Um, yeah. Oh, so good. This is so good. Um, so, uh, you know, you're, you seem to do a lot of like either personal research or your own reading and stuff. So what do you think the benefits are to like neuropsych research? And if we were to use that, how could that help change our behaviors or maybe other people's behaviors? 
Yeah, the neuropsych stuff is like so fascinating. And I think I think the thing that really got me going on it is recognizing how much marketing, the marketing industry is paying attention to neuropsych research because marketing is behavior change. They want you to go to the store and buy their product. That is a behavior change. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was really where I started to pay attention to it. And then thinking about how do I use it in my way. So some of the first things I started doing in terms of messaging, like when we talk numbers, we go into an analytical place in our minds that we, and like, so it's pretty common if you go to a program on domestic violence or sexual assault, there's some statistics that are shared at the beginning. And the thought being is like, oh, if you were, are so worried about all these people experiencing harm, you'll be called to sell, you know, to step up. But what they found is that when we put when we present people with numbers, they go into an analytical space and then you have to work even harder to get them to the empathetic space. So, you know, reframing that, like, let me tell you a story about a friend of mine. And so getting people engaged in the topic Mm -hmm. that way. And so that, that was really where it began. Um, But there's also um, why diets make us fat. I think that was like the book that I stumbled upon that was like, oh my gosh. And uh, Sandra Amut, I think is the author and she has a TEDx presentation and, you know, looking at all of the ways our body is wired for survival and like, like diet, you know, it's just like your body's always going to win. Like it's always, <laughs> so, it's there to protect us. Yeah, It's there to protect us. And we're not meant to starve ourselves. Yeah. That's not I, normal. We were, I was laughing with some students earlier because I was like, my, my partner made brownies a couple of days ago and I ate a brownie and I immediately wanted another one. I'm like, well, that's a sign that it's not serving my nutrition needs. It's serving my emotional needs mm-hmm. or my mm-hmm. stimulant needs, but it's not serving, you know, and, and like we, I feel like there's just some simple things of just understanding how, you know, chemical, you know, just chemical reactions. If it is that fast, it's a drug-like reaction. And I was saying, it's like, yeah, well, like when you eat lentils, like it takes a couple of days before your body's like, you know, I feel better. That lentil thing was a good idea. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You don't feel it immediately. Yeah. It's so true. It's so true. But yeah, I mean, that's such a good point. I think just a lot of times when people work with me, they, they often say it's nice to understand the why behind all of the things that I'm recommending or that I'm teaching them. They understand it. And so we live in this society where marketing is throwing things at us to tell us exactly what we wanted, like telling us exactly what to do. And because we're so busy and we kind of just want to fix it really quickly, we do those things, but it's so fleeting because at the end of the day, unless you understand why you're doing it, and really want to make sure that it's something that fits for you and your lifestyle, like it's not going to last, you know, and we want to be told what to do, but not really. You want to be taught because you like your own schedule. You like the foods that you eat. You like your families and your cultural background. And like, you like your social life, whatever's left of it, COVID, like, you know, you like that stuff. And so to be told what to do without any consideration to those things and not being taught how to be flexible within those things. Like it's not, it's not really going to yield behavior change. It's going to have you do something temporarily, yeah. but it's not going to really help you in the long run. And I yeah. think having the understanding and awareness behind it is what helps drive the behavior to actually, you know, keep going. Yeah. I think about like the stumble upon kinds of things, you know, it's like the, the science that we learn because we happen to like a social media page and you walk away with some interesting thing, you know, because some time ago you, you decide to make that one small thing, uh, you know, and I, I think like, like when I'm physically going to the office, I usually just fill my lunchbox with all kinds of healthy foods. Cause when I'm at my office, like the food that is closest to me is the food that gets eaten. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then it's like, well, it's okay. anyone. <laughs> office, office, home. It's so true. We're yeah. going to grab what's convenient. We're, we're, yeah. we're smart. We are very smart. So we're just going to take what's available to us. Yep. Um, But, you know, I think one of the aha moments I feel I've had around around food is like, I'm just really sick of people totally saying that a diet is like the the success of a diet is based on lost weight, like Mm. shouldn't like the success of a diet be based on I feel happy, my my mood is stable, Mm -hmm. I have the energy to like keep up with a kid and a professional job, you know, it's like we don't give enough like those are really the things that are meaningful. The things that bring us meaning in life yeah. and joy in life are those things. And, you know, it, there's a lot to unpack about that. 
definitely definitely and yeah I think we'll unfortunately have to talk about it a lot for a while <laughs> until people really understand that it's actually not a, the indicator of your health um but we'll get there in time in time um I think just even to what what we just talked about today it really correlates to making new you know behavior changes with your lifestyle whether it's your nutrition your fitness your sleep uh your self-care stress management because it's I think what you said from the very beginning it's just helpful to know that it's a process and that there's different stages and there's different seasons and it's okay if you kind of go back a little bit and it really just doesn't it's really just becomes like you know, why do I want this? And, you know, maybe what's no longer working for me that worked for me. And like, is there a reason behind that? Like, is it now winter and I used to run and now it's, you know, in this, in the winter, I don't run, like, just get curious with it. Stop. I think we have to stop blaming ourselves and stop um, criticizing ourselves and beating ourselves up if we're not taking action. Because like you said, everything you're doing now is leading you up to it. Those who are listening to this podcast, that you could move, you're, you're, you're definitely in the contemplation stage. Cause if you were in the pre-contemplation stage, this wouldn't even be something that you'd be listening to. So you're at least in the contemplation stage, which is awesome. Cause that means that you're so close to taking action. But even if you don't, you just kind of stay here one day, something's going to click and it's all going to make sense for you. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah yeah. well and I think like for me I'm a sugar addict when I get stressed like it's it's sugar and I have like this little container of um like those little party buttermint things that sometimes you get at restaurants like oh you know and I I bought a four pound bag of them (laughs) (laughs) I had to buy them online because the local grocery store didn't have them and I was like oh my gosh I'm like because I get like this and and I was like, I was like, well, I know I need to eat less of these, but I was like, let me just focus on eating more fruits and vegetables. And, you know, it didn't make a difference the first week, but the second week it did. And I mm-hmm. think, you know, my body needed to maybe get those safe signals too. that. Oh, okay. Well, you also through repeated exposure, you didn't say I can't have this. You said I can have this, but you also added other things that take its place. And after a while, if you had it every day, you know, you eventually are like, all right, I need, you know, the novelty always fades, whether it's a diet or whether it's like a food you, you, that's around you, like just let yourself have it. Cause eventually you're probably not going to want it so badly. And you know, like, that's okay. Like, and even if you do like, that's okay, you know? So yep. Yeah, that's awesome. It's what you do to get through, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Um, is there anything else that you feel like we should talk about or anything else you want our listeners to know before we kind of wrap up? Oh my gosh. That's a very open-ended question. I yeah. Think- I well, I like to give you the opportunity yeah. to put a bow yeah. on it. Gets <laughs> it to be gentle with yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're surrounded by a culture that seems to think it's okay that being screamed at as a way to motivate motivate somebody. And, and I just, I don't see that as, mm-hmm. as anything that has ever made me want to do anything mm-hmm. positive or make any changes. So, you know, we are, we're all capable, you know, you just accept that you're where you are today and that's where you were supposed to be. And, you know, it's small changes and Definitely. sometimes a small change is just saying, it's okay if I spend the rest of the day on the couch without guilt. And that's Yes, definitely. Especially with everything going on right now, like we're all just like burnt at both ends. And I think giving yourself a day to just chill, you know, will give you the recharge that you're trying to get all these things accomplished. Like it can wait a day. It can wait. Like, it's okay. (laughs) You'll feel better if you let yourself rest up. Yep. Definitely. Awesome. All right, Rebecca, well, this has been amazing. Is there, how can people contact you if maybe if they have follow-up questions or they want to just share maybe what they, what they learned or their takeaways, how would they sure. get in touch with you? Um, so they can email me at Rebecca.Harrington at Oneana.edu and that would, that would get them in contact with me. Perfect. Okay. So I'll put your email in the show notes. Thank you so much for being here. For everybody listening, thank you for being here. If you like this episode, take a screenshot of it and tag me on your story at tips underscore with underscore Tony or the tips with Tony podcast. If you haven't already subscribed to the podcast or wrote a nice review, please do so. It allows other people to find the podcast, which means other people get to listen to these amazing messages and hopefully are inspired to create behavior change. All right, guys, that is it for me today. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Tony 
Maranucci, your registered dietitian, helping you get healthy one bite at a time.